ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Leviticus and chapter 15. We're continuing our series in the book of Leviticus, and this is one of those passages where it's a good reminder that it's good for us to work our way through a whole book, taking whatever comes next, because this is probably not a passage I would be inclined to preach on if it weren't for the fact that it was next after the end of chapter 14, as you will no doubt uh, uncover as we go. Let me pray for us as we prepare to read God's word together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given your word, which is sufficient to teach us, rebuke us, correct us, train us, so that we might be fully equipped for every good work, that you give a whole Bible to whole Christians so that we can follow you in every area of life. And so we pray that you would speak to us in this time, for your servants are listening. Amen. Hear now the reading of God's word from Leviticus chapter 15. There the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this is the law of his uncleanness for a discharge. Whether his body runs with his discharge or his body is blocked up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed on which the one with the discharge lies shall be unclean, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever sits on anything on which the one with the discharge has sat shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches the body of the one with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if the one with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And any saddle on which the one with the discharge rides shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries such things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Anyone whom the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And an earthenware vessel that the one with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. And when the one with a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his body in fresh water and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. And the priest shall use them, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. If a man has an omission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until the evening. And every garment and every skin on which the semen comes shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. If a man lies with a woman and has an omission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. When a woman has a discharge, and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whether it is the bed or anything on which she sits, when he, when he touches it, she, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lies with her and her menstrual impurity comes upon him, he shall be unclean seven days. And every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening.' 
But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. This is the law for him who has a discharge and for him who has an emission of semen becoming unclean thereby. Also for her who is unwell with her menstrual impurity, that is for anyone, male or female, who has a discharge, and for the man who lies with a woman who is unclean. This is God's word. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. Some things are awkward to talk about. There's not really any way around it. There's not anything I remember from seminary that prepared me to stand in the pulpit and talk about penile discharges and menstrual bleeding and emissions of semen. Some things are just uncomfortable. I think I'd rather preach about money. But things can be uncomfortable to talk about because they're so personal and so private. And yet as I I look at this passage this morning, I think that's kind of the point. That we're meant to see how personal and private these matters are and be reminded of the lesson from the passage, which is this. Nothing is too private or too personal for God to care about. Nothing is too private or personal for God to care about. I want to walk through this passage this morning and see first two reasons for this law. And then second, we'll see two comforts for this law. So look with me first at the two reasons. We see it, it both promotes purity and also teaches about our private and personal sin that we might deal with. Look first at how it promotes purity, and and under this heading we'll try to explain the text as best we can. It deals with various discharges uh, that men and women can experience, and as we work through the passage you see that all of them either relate to sexual intimacy or things that might hinder sexual intimacy. It's actually arranged in a pattern that's called a a chiasm, where the the outside edges of the text are parallel to one another. It's almost like a sandwich, right? And like any good sandwich, what's most important is what's in the middle, right? You don't have a white bread sandwich. You have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And what you see is in the middle of this sandwich is the focus on the man and the woman coming together in marital intimacy. And on the outside are all of these discharges that relate to other things that make them unclean and hinder that relationship. And you have both normal discharges, menstrual bleeding and emissions of semen, and you have abnormal discharges, continuing bleeding long beyond the menstrual cycle, and also whatever is described by many scholars as something related to uh, gonorrhea, as seems to be maybe the most common uh, diagnosis that's given. It could be related to other things, but that seems to be what's in view here, some sort of longer discharge. And all of it makes you unclean. And one of the things that stands out as you work through this passage is not only does it all make you unclean, but your uncleanness is highly contagious. Did you notice that? Anything you touch, anyone you touch, anything you sit on, transfers uncleanness to that thing or that person. If you sit in a chair and get up and then someone else later comes and sits down in that chair, they become unclean. This uncleanness is highly contagious and In their uncleanness, they cannot come to the tabernacle in order to worship God and participate in holy things. At the end of their time of uncleanness, there's a period of cleansing. Either you wash and wait until evening, or in some cases, you must wait seven days. And then if it was an abnormal discharge, you need to bring sacrifices. Probably the the best guess as why no sacrifices are needed for normal issues is that they're normal bodily functions, whereas the abnormal discharges are more related to sickness or illness in some sense. And so you bring a sacrifice because the the reminder is that anything that is uh, lacking wholeness is unclean. To come into the Lord's presence, you must have clean hands and a pure heart. You must be whole, body and soul. And so anything that falls short of wholeness is unclean. And what's unclean cannot come into the presence of a holy God. And so that's why the warnings given there in verse 31, you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die 
in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. High stakes here. You can die by coming into the presence of the Lord as one who is unclean. The question, though, is why does this make you unclean? We've seen already in other sections of Leviticus that any loss of bodily fluid makes you unclean, particularly blood. Because the life of a creature is in its blood, Leviticus says. And so the loss of blood symbolizes the loss of life. And so any loss of these things makes one unclean. And you have to remember, it's a a ritual uncleanness, not moral guilt, right? The passage nowhere assumes that you've somehow committed sin and are unclean as a consequence of your sin. In fact, even when it talks about uh, a man and a woman together, in marital intimacy, we're reminded that sex is not bad or inherently sinful. No, it's a good gift from God. Yes, it's to be enjoyed only in the context of a biblical marriage between a man and a woman, but it's a good gift from God when used rightly, something to be celebrated and enjoyed, not something that is bad or uh, inherently sinful in any way. And so this is not saying that any of these things are sinful in themselves, but as we've seen with all of these issues of uncleanness, uncleanness teaches us about sin, even if it's not the same thing as sin, as we'll see. But I think there's more reasons why we might wonder why this law would be given. If sex in marriage is such a good thing, why does God give a law that at least on its face seems to discourage sex in marriage? Gordon Wenham in his commentary brings this out. He says the practical effect of this legislation was that when a man had religious duties to perform, whether this involved worship or participation in God's holy wars, sexual intercourse was not permitted. And I don't know if you've thought about that, but it seems odd because God creates man and woman in the beginning and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And he gives them this cultural mandate And yet here in Leviticus, he takes that very act of procreation and says that that act, even in the context of marriage, makes you unclean. Why would one become unclean while doing the very thing that God had commanded to be fruitful and multiply? And I think we're meant to see that this law is given to promote purity among God's people. And to really understand it, you have to understand the context in which they're being led to the land of Canaan where they're surrounded by pagan nations who worship other gods. And one of the defining features of pagan worship was uh, worshiping in sexual ways. They had temple prostitutes at the temples where you would go and worship these idols. And so God is giving these laws in a way that says, even though sex and marriage is good, sex and worship must be kept separate. That is not how you are to worship the true and living God. To the fact that even when you and your spouse engage in God-glorifying marital intimacy, you still have to wait until your uncleanness is done before you come into my presence for holy things. It's to promote purity. And of course, this is a real problem for the Israelites because they've just gotten beyond the incident with the golden calf where they have Aaron make for them false gods. And of course, he he tries to tell them, this is Yahweh. He says, these are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he says, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh, to the Lord. And the people celebrate, they feast, and then they rise up to play, which is a euphemism for sexual immorality, many suggest. And so this is a, a live problem that the people are dealing with and need to be guarded against. This law is given, among many things, to restrain a casual and promiscuous attitude towards sexuality among God's people. Gordon Wenham, again, he he brings this out and he says that there's several reasons. Not only does it make you unclean, but there would be a stigma on things like prostitution in Israel. And beyond that, it would uh, protect women who are captured in battle since the men must be ritually clean for warfare. And so it has all kinds of ways that it promotes and protects the vulnerable and protects uh, the purity of God's people. And so he says, in this way, these regulations may have promoted restraint in relations between the sexes and have acted as a break on the passions of the young. And we need to see from that that God's law always promotes holiness and deters sin. God's law always promotes holiness because his laws are good. 
I've recently been reading through Psalm 119. It's amazing how often the psalmist rejoices in God's righteous rules. God's laws are the path of life, and they are righteous and good and lovely. How can a young man keep his way pure, the psalmist asked, by guarding it according to your word. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Later on in the psalm, towards the very end, he says, Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. God's law is given to help us live and praise him. It promotes our holiness, and it discourages and deters sin. I think that's an important reminder for us as we find ourselves living in a society, certainly not the first time in history, but we're living in a time where our society has cast off the restraints of God's law and is running headlong towards sin in almost every area of life. It's so important for us to store up God's word in our hearts that we might not sin against him, that we might keep our way pure. We see God's law promotes purity among his people in this way. But it also teaches us about sin in our private and in our personal lives. God cares about the private lives of his people, and he cares about how we approach him as those who live for him faithfully in every area of our lives by his grace. And that's why that warning of verse 31 says, If you come in your uncleanness, you might die. The stakes are that high because uncleanness teaches us about sin and it reminds us that no sin is too private or personal for God to care about, right? No sin is too small to fight. No sin is so small that you can ignore it or tolerate it in your lives because every sin, no matter how small you and I might think it is, deserves God's wrath and curse both in this life and in that which is to come. It makes us unclean. And we see two two aspects under this. We see first that private sin can have a public impact. And we also see that private sin can have painful consequences. Can have a public impact. These are personal issues that someone's dealing with in Leviticus 15. They're the kinds of things that outside of your immediate family, no one might ever be told that you have this condition, this issue that you're dealing with. It's a private issue, and yet it can have a significant impact. You're not sent outside the camp like the leper was, but everything about your life has to be different. You have to be careful who you touch and what you sit on because you can spread your uncleanness. And you could make someone unclean. They won't know they're unclean. They can go into the temple and die because they've gone into the tabernacle in their uncleanness. And have a public consequences and a public impact. Because friends, private sins don't stay private, do they? Sin can't be controlled or contained. Recently, Lee and I watched back through the Jurassic Park movies. And it's amazing as you watch through those movies how every time the dinosaurs get out and wreak havoc on everyone around them, and yet somehow someone comes along and say, this time we've got the problem solved. This time we can contain them. This time we can control them. And and guess what? Spoiler alert, it never works. They always get out because you can't contain them. You can't control them. And the same is true with your sin. It starts small, a thought in your head, and you nurse that thought, and that thought gives way to looks. And that lust grows, and it becomes pornography, and it leads you to fornication and adultery. Sin wants you to move beyond desire into action. It does not stay contained. It does not stay controlled. You need to kill sin at the very first rising in your heart. Otherwise, it wants to grow and lead all kinds of dangerous places. That's true of any sin we could look at in our lives. Sin doesn't want to stay private and controlled and contained. It wants to get out and have a public impact. And it has painful consequences when it does. Sin always hurts. Sin always destroys because, friends, sin leads to death. It holds out the promise of pleasure in the short term, but it always leads to death. That's what James tells us in James chapter 1. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You might not ever see the impact that your sin has on others, and yet it still hurts you, doesn't it? 
the warning of verse 31 that there could be death for coming into God's presence for uncleanness is still a real threat. Sin leads to death. It leads to physical death. Rebellion against God is bad for you. That's one of the things you see throughout the scriptures. Sin is bad for your health. There are all kinds of consequences that come from living in rejection and rebellion against God. And that's why one of the most dangerous lies that we are fed today is that we should overlook sin in people's private lives because we're told it's not hurting anyone. Why do you care what I do in private if I'm not hurting anyone? I've made the case that one of the key aspects of this law is given to to restrain a promiscuous and casual attitude towards sexual things. We're told it's not hurting anyone. What's been the fruit of our culture casting off those restraints of God's law and embracing a promiscuous, casual attitude towards sex? Are people not being hurt by sexually transmitted diseases? Are people not being hurt, families being destroyed by divorce and adultery? Is the plague of fatherlessness in our nation not causing harm to anyone? Are the women and children that are exploited in pornography and human trafficking not being hurt? What about victims of assault and abuse? What about abortion and the children that are murdered, sacrificed on the altar of sexual freedom? Are they not being hurt? That's not even to mention the whole host of other sexual perversions that come when we cast off the restraints of God's law and all the damaging and harmful consequences that they bring as well. Sin hurts people. Sin has painful consequences. Don't say it's not hurting anyone. Not only is it hurting you, when a whole society goes after it, it destroys people's lives. And worse, it destroys their souls. Because not only does sin lead to physical death, sin leads to spiritual death. It leads to eternal death. It leads to eternal torment away from the presence of the Lord. Outer darkness in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who persist in their rebellion against God ultimately get what they most desire. A life away from the Lord and only in the presence of his wrath poured out upon them for all eternity. Sin will destroy your soul. Even the sin that you think is so small that you can ignore and keep tucked away that no one else might notice. Friends, you're meant to see from this passage that your private life matters to God. Man may look on the outward appearance and think that all is fine, but the Lord looks at your heart and he knows what's going on. All of your life is lived before the face of God. He knows all that you say, and he sees all that you do, and he hears all that you say, and he knows all that you think. There are no small sins before God's face. Your private life matters to him, living in obedience to him in all areas of life. We see that sin is contagious, that it has a public impact and painful consequences, and we're reminded that every single one of us falls short in these areas. And you might be a little bit overwhelmed, wondering, what hope is there? What do we do from here? And I think that's where we see these two comforts come in from this law. And the first, friends, is come to Christ. You see, the whole point of this law is to teach you that you cannot clean yourself up in order to come to Jesus For forgiveness, no, you come in all of your uncleanness, in all of your sin, you come to him so that he can cleanse you. You come to Christ for cleansing because the promise is that his blood can make the foulest clean and his blood is availed for me and his blood is availed for you. You come to Christ for cleansing. It's amazing reading this story, this passage in Leviticus 15 and then flipping over to the Gospels and you hear about a woman who was in this exact condition, bleeding, not for just a couple weeks longer than she's supposed to, but for 12 years. What were you doing in 2011? Can you imagine having been unclean and unwell for 12 years? 
And this woman was so desperate to clean herself up and to get, to get well, she couldn't uh, embrace her husband, she couldn't kiss her children because she couldn't touch them without making them unclean, and she wanted to be well, so she searched high and low everywhere she could, looking for someone who might be able to help and paying all of her money to any doctor that offered even the slightest hope of a cure. And not only did it not help, we're told that everything she tried only made her worse. Until finally one day she hears of one. And when she hears, she knows that this Jesus, he can heal her. But she's so ashamed of her uncleanness that she knows all she, all she has to do is come up and touch him. But she sneaks up behind him and touches the hem of his garment, trusting that he'll make her clean. And something amazing happens in that exact instant when she touches him. You've heard of how contagious this uncleanness is. And you expect to read that she touches him and Jesus became unclean. But that's not what happens, is it? No, she touches him in the very instant she touches him. He is not made unclean. She is cleansed. She instantly felt in her body that she was made well. And friends, that's because sin is no match for Jesus, is it? Isn't that what Paul tells us in Romans 5? Sin and death are contagious. One man sinned one time, and sin and death have spread to us all. And along came another Adam, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And though through the one man's disobedience, sin and death spread to all, through the one man's obedience, life, And righteousness is given to all. Is that not astounding? One sin was enough to plunge the entire human race into eternal suffering because of the infinite wrath of God for one sin. And Jesus comes along by his life and his death and his resurrection and atones for every sin that has ever been committed by every one of his people, past, present, and future. Sin is no match for Christ, brothers and sisters. And he stands and he offers life and cleansing to all who will come. Come to him and be healed and cleansed of all your iniquities and all your diseases. And this is dealing with sin in our private life. And no one knows the sin in your private life like you do. And all of us, as we examine our own hearts, ought to be able to stand right next to Paul when he calls himself the chief of sinners. And we ought to be able to stand to others and say, no, I'm the chief of sinners. And that means if his blood can cleanse me, it can surely cleanse you. We see the comfort of our purification in Christ. Maybe the last comfort that we get from this passage is when it speaks of our private obedience. Because you see, part of the whole point is that private sin is a big deal. But the flip side is also true, that if private sin is a big deal and God never ignores it, that means private obedience is not insignificant to our Lord. Certainly not to earn your salvation. You can never clean yourself up. But once you've received God's free grace lavished upon you and your life of obedience flows out of love and gratitude for God as the result of his grace, he's genuinely pleased By the obedience of his children. He's pleased by the obedience of his children, even if it's completely unseen and unknown by others. It's still precious in his sight, friends. Boys and girls, that means God sees when you're kind to your siblings. It means God sees when you stick up for the child that's being bullied at school. It means God sees when you're honest with your parents, even though you know that it's going to get you in trouble. God sees when you say no to peer pressure because you don't want to sin against him. Moms, when you deny yourself and serve your family and do what seems like the tenth load of laundry today and no one even remembers to thank you for it, your God sees. God sees you and I when we don't give in to gossip, when we make a meal for someone who needs it, when we refuse to engage in underhanded politics at work to get ahead. God sees these things, friends. You remember Jesus sitting in the temple courts as people brought their gifts and people brought large, massive sums and gave them in the noisiest way possible to draw attention to themselves. And in comes a woman that pretty much no one else even knows is in the temple courts. She walks up and she just throws two pennies quietly into the offering plate. And Jesus calls all his disciples together and draws attention to her 
It says, you probably didn't even see her, but she gave more than anyone because they gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, out of her lack, gave all that she had. Isn't that the picture of what happens in heaven? Not only do we see that when a sinner is brought to repentance as they're rejoicing among the angels in heaven, but can't you imagine your heavenly father in heaven watching you obey and, and t- calling his angels together? Did, did you see that? Did you see how she told the truth when she didn't have to? No one would have known if she lied, and yet she wanted to please me. And so she told the truth. Did you see how he cleaned up his room when no one was looking just because he knows it would please me to obey his mommy and daddy? The Lord rejoices in the small obedience of his people. Friends, don't despise the day of small things. Your God doesn't despise the day of small things. Nothing is too private or personal for God to care about. And of course, private sin is offensive to God, and yet even that is why he sent his son, so that you might have life in him. And in Christ, if you have trusted in Jesus for forgiveness, your sins are nailed to the cross. You've been cleansed by his blood and clothed with his righteousness. And so you stand before God in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism as if you had never sinned and only obeyed. Oh, precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other fount I know, none but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, what a a good reminder it is to us that we live our lives before your face. You see all that we do. May we be on guard to fight sin in every area of our lives, giving it no no place to grow, no place to thrive, but may we also remember the hope and the blessing and the comfort we have knowing that we are Christ's and he is ours and that in him none of our labors are in vain as you are pleased by all of our obedience that arises out of love for you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.